and, uh, and next, I'm excited to uh, introduce our, um, our panel. Uh, we um, are calling this a fireside chat, um, no fire, uh, but um, we'll be on fire. So hopefully that will uh, do, the, uh, do the job for us. Um, I'd like to um, call up um, if, if, um, if everyone is here, I'll ask my, my team members. We have Lee Lambert here. Uh, he is the chancellor of Pima Community College, who a lot of you know. Um, we actually need to start with him for a couple of questions. Um, I would say, team, you know, the others can join as they come in because uh, we'll, we'll hopefully have time to do some interaction. But as the others come in, by all means, let's, um, let's bring them up on stage. But we know that we needed to start with Dr. Lambert because he has a meeting with the governor. Is that right, uh, uh, Dr. Lambert, uh, that we, we had to work around so, here? So Kathleen, uh, as, you, as life may ha has it, the thing got rescheduled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe you can be on for the whole panel and we can be more interactive. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yes. All right. Well, we'll still start with you, but um, I would say uh, Emily and, uh, and, and production team, um, feel free to have the others uh, come up as they arrive. Um, we, uh, and I'll go ahead and, and, and mention them now. We have, we have Dr. Sue Elsperman, who is the president of Ivy Tech uh, uh, Community College, and uh, who, she joined that role after being other Sue. Hi. Um, she has been um, the, uh, she was, is also the, the 50th, was the 50th Lieutenant Governor of the state of Indiana, which uh, gives her a very good statewide perspective on transformation. And she's also been involved uh, with, uh, Ivy Tech's been involved in our single mom's work and she's been very influential in that. Um, and then Dr. Rufus Glasper is uh, President and CEO of the League for Innovation in the Community College. Dr. Glasper um, is, uh, it was the one in the picture. If the, for those of you who are here at the very start of today, I flashed up the picture of our first prototyping session for micro pathways. He invited us to do that in Seattle um, on day one of COVID in the United States, um, not knowing uh, of course that that was going to happen, but um, Dr. Glasper has been such a great champion and his organization has both helped us frame uh, this initiative and to, and to keep it in the context of other uh, other um, uh, innovation initiatives going on in the realm of community colleges, which he, he and, and his organization have been at the helm of. So um, it's, this is a very exciting group to, to round out our day. Um, okay, I, I'm going to start, if that's okay, with uh, Dr. Lambert. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, we've, we've actually written an op-ed together, which we could put in the chat as well, that talks about kind of what we learned together about this, because you were a partner of the labs before this as well with some other projects, but what has been for you the most exciting and maybe even the most surprising uh, uh, thing about this accelerated design year for you? Uh, it was, and, and how does it play into what you wanted to do anyway at, at, at Pima Community College? Because you're a huge innovator, you know, before we ever showed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Kathleen, I want to thank you and your team for asking Pima to be part of this exciting uh, project. Uh, it's truly transformative and it's a pleasure to be all with Sue and Rufus. I remember being there with you and Rufus and others in Seattle on that very first day <laughs> that we got this unfortunate news that we're all now living through. Uh, let me put this in, a, in, in probably a 30,000 foot level for a moment because it really is illustrative of what we're doing at Pima. So Ian Morrison wrote a book back in the late 90s called The Second Curve. And for folks who are not familiar with the second curve, I thought I'd just read just one little passage out of there because I think it sets the stage for why Pima and why uh, uh, micropathways and beyond. He, he's citing to Stein's law. If something is unsustainable in the long run, it will end. And the corollary is if something is going to be a big deal in the future, it's got to start sometime. Mm -hmm. I believe our model is on an unsustainable path. I mean, you know, we've been a decade or more now of declining enrollments. Our relevancy is in question. So what more do we need to know to know that our first curve model is not going to get it done anymore? I'm not saying it's going away, but it's not going to get it done anymore. So we needed to really look to venture out into something. And then when you approached us and said, would you like to be part of this? I, th I think this was an opportunity to get more onto that second curve. 
So mm -hmm. when you think about the second curve, the new technologies, new consumers, new ge geographic market opportunities, this was one of those initiatives, I think, that I, I think really answers that call to, mm -hmm. to get on that second curve, but it isn't without risk and it does require courage of leaders to see that. So, so let me you know, just say that as a way of providing that context. Uh, so we, we have long known that we've been in service to the non-traditional learner. I mean, we, we, Ian talks about this and we talk about it a lot. We're in service to what we refer to as the lost decade. People leave high school and they wander around and then they show up back at our doorstep, but now they're 27, 28, 29. And so how can we better engage them and make ourselves relevant to their needs? Micro pathways is certainly one big opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me just, just you know, stop there uh, for now. So, um, you know, Ian was answering a question in the chat a few minutes ago and somebody asked, you know, doesn't, that, don't micro pathways cannibalize your, your four credit uh, course offerings or your, you know, your hope that people are in to a degree program. Um, I think, I think you, uh, how do you see it? Well, it, it actually, you know, that's, I think one of the challenges of moving from the first curve to the second curve, right? Mm -hmm. Is that going to cannibalize what you're doing? I think it actually expands because when you think about it, you're actually focused on a group that you aren't ordinarily serving in a robust way. And so when you look at it from the customer perspective, now we need to do a better job of the new majority learners. That's not cannibalizing away from who we were serving, which was the traditional learner coming out of high school. So we're talking, so it's not, but what it does do, it builds a, a stronger curriculum that now brings both together. Uh, and I think that's one of the positive things about this. So I don't see it as cannibalizing. I see it as expanding uh, our offerings and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Kathleen, can I add? Yes, to that? I was just going yes, to thank you. offer you on the same thank topic. You. Oh, no, it's a, it, Lee, your answer is great. And at Ivy Tech, our associate degree production has remained steady for the last five years that I've been here. But the tremendous growth has been in all of our certificates, right? And certifications. And those areas we went from 21,000 five years ago to 38,000 completions. Those are high quality, all above median wage kinds of credentials that allow, that's all we can, we take credit for. If they, if they don't earn median wage, we don't count it as a short-term credential, but that's where you see the opportunity with these micro pathways. And now these give us the opportunity to be even more micro, which is meeting that adult learner where they are and allowing them to have the confidence, I agree with Lee, the confidence to go into the next level and the next and the next, instead of this going to school for four years or more before you have anything of value. So I, I think it is just a function. And then I'll say maybe because of my political background as a as an ex-lieutenant governor, our general assemblies, our legislatures across the country, they're behind micro pathways. They understand that higher education is, they may not call it exactly broke, but they'll say, you know, it's not being bought as it is. So in a red state like ours, this is exactly the right way to go. And I don't think it's just red either. I think it's for all, if you wanna be inclusive, this is a way to really be inclusive and to bring all citizens along wherever they are. And I'm just so complimentary of the work that EDL is helping to lead and help to bring us along on because as Lee, it is the second curve, Lee, I 100% agree. And we have to go into the direction that employers need and citizens need to succeed. Uh, before we go to Rufus, um, I, I'd like to follow up uh, doc, uh, Dr. Elsperman with, with the, the question though about, okay, because we talked about these statistics that you were seeing that your your degree programs were flat. You had some interesting growth coming from dual enrollment from the high school students, mm -hmm. but your real growth area was in just-in-time learning, in yep. and out, short certificates. But you could have kept doing that as just certificates. What is it about micro pathways that either connects the dots or gives 
people a more meaningful trajectory to uh, to high demand, um, you know, living wage jobs, yeah. et cetera. You know, in an environment where talent is is in high demand, uh, adults don't have time to even complete that what we would call a CT, a short-term credential, 18 to 21 hours, we still had our students needing something more immediately. And never was that better expressed than when the pandemic hit and the state approached Ivy Tech to say, can you help us immediately get these unemployed hospitality and other workers into a short-term credential? And, at, and we have in Indiana a, a good set of credentials, not quite micro yet, but we added CDL plus and some of these made it onto that shorter list, which meant it didn't need federal financial aid. The state was willing to cover it. So there's a willingness by our constituents, our stakeholders for us to go this way. And it really is just up to us and having people like Stacy Townsley on my team as a designer in residence who can help us show that transition from non-credit to credit to these shorter term credentials, micro pathways, uh, leading into showing that stackability throughout for the long-term. And you know, we, it's on us to do it in a high quality way because we actually have, if we're not careful, we could mess it up. But if we do it with integrity and that's where your help is so important, as we do it in a high quality way, it will be, natural. It will be like, of course, we should have been doing this all along. So Dr. Glasper, I want to bring you in. So you were bullish on, you know, uh, Dr. Glasper is on uh, the Education Design Labs board, and he was bullish from, you know, the six months before we had the Seattle meeting um, in, in thinking about how do we help colleges figure this out? And so why, why Dr. Glasper, did you feel sure that colleges would respond to this approach of of, of a rapid design process and uh, you know, focused on micro-credentials as sort of the entry point for this kind of response to, to, um, to a need for transformation? Well, first and foremost, Kathleen, I just want to thank everyone for a fantastic day. Mm -hmm. uh, I am just been sitting back and listening to the growth and the enthusiasm and the passion and I'm saying it's long overdue. Uh, we have an opportunity, and I think it's been described very, very well, to, to change the curve that we have been on, uh, the trajectory that we have been on, the, the, the capsule that we have been in for many years, and to break and support the, the term that's being used, majority learner, and, and with the pandemic, the focus was right on, 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 on those individuals. And there was no answer. And the answer was there, but the answer was, had been populated in what I would describe as a for-profit community and not necessarily available to those who can afford or should afford a public education. And so they were stressed. Uh, we're talking about those who who have the uh, family wage uh, middle class or whatever for a family of four, but they're using these resources to go to an education that can move faster, quicker, and put something in their hands that they believe is usable in today's market. And I think what the, uh, the approach of the Community College Growth Engine Fund uh, has, 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 has done is to say that public education through the community colleges can move just as fast, mm -hmm. can bring in their, their community of which they already own and can bring in that thinking. However, uh, we didn't have the, uh, we were innovative, we had the mindset, but we didn't have the window and the drive because we have these archaic structures that say we must follow lockstep, we must do it by, credit hours in this space. We must do it by uh, quality assurance. Uh, and, and that's going to be a big issue in mm -hmm. terms of bringing in the notion of uh, education, moving at the speed of business. 
And what I, what I think that the model has done with micro pathways and credentials has offered an opportunity for us to redefine what does that mean and redefine it in a way that is inclusive of a partnership with industry and not just have industry sitting around an advisory table. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think if, if we lose this energy, uh, we're talking about um, uh, all, of, all of the, the, the great resignations and we're talking about the lost generations. This is an opportunity to pull and jumpstart and say, this is a pathway, use it, fund it, embrace it and move forward. So. Um, I wanted to, to uh, just kind of refresh your all's uh, memories with this slide because what we what we see happening, and this is what uh, Dr. Lambert and I wrote about in in, a, in an op-ed piece recently, is that the this gateway effect of you know you're using the micro pathway to get started, uh, but it actually brings uh, it starts to build the the innovation muscle in 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 so many of these areas. I wanted just to get you all to talk about this and to say what, how do we keep that momentum up that Dr. Glasper is talking about? What, what should come next? Um, Dr. Lambert, you use the term universal design and that's part of your vision for your innovation framework for the whole uh, system. But how do we, what do you think? What's next for you? So for, let me, again, I always like to talk, you know, big, bigger pitch. So part of it is a mindset shift that, each of us have to make. Uh, and, and so, you know, we talk about growth mindset and things like that, but it, what does that really mean unless you're actually doing it, right? And so I, I look at this and say, okay, what's the approach? We use what we call the four lenses of innovation. So Rowan Gibson wrote this great book called The Four Lenses. And, and, and real quickly, they talk about challenging the orthodoxy. So, so if you're not willing to cha challenge your status quo, you're not gonna get the innovation that leads to a micro pathway. Uh, you have to uh, be willing to harness the trends, right? What, what's going on and then understand the needs. And I think the ed design approach is really about that human centered approach, understanding the need of the learner. Uh, and that really helps to open this up and then leveraging your resources in our case, our partnerships and in a real meaningful way. I think Rufus touched on this and so did Sue where they are actually co-pilots with us. Mm -hmm. They're no longer sitting on an advisory panel. They're actually in there with us designing what they need. Um, and so, so I think that those are the kinds of things that we're gonna take to our liberal arts side of the college. Because I think that's the side for us. That's our first curve. We've got to bring on to the second curve. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will not be able to sustain ourselves as an organization because that's where we make the lion's share of our revenue. Right. And, right. So and that's part of this artificial yes, um, uh, got it. Uh, separation between credit and non-credit that you're, you're using micro pathways in part to blend the two types of programs together. Right. Exactly. Because in my mind, everything we do is about preparing you for a career. And that's all about workforce. Mm -hmm. And one takes you quicker, micro pathways. The other takes you a little longer, liberal arts to transfer to baccalaureate. In some cases, like many of us on this call, we went on to graduate school, right? Mm -hmm. But in the end, what gets me started? A micro pathway gets me started, especially for, I think, the new majority learners where they don't have the same time to invest and so forth. So let's get them engaged early on. But before before leaving you on this point, though, we don't want to leave the impression that there that the stack of bill that that this short term pathway is is tracking people towards just short vocational programs. I mean, the reason to do it here in this context, rather than a boot camp, is it not is to is to have the opportunity to have to, to see the entire pathway and the the build that you can do towards better and better careers. That, that's right. That's why our universal design approach. Mm -hmm. It's already built into the model. So then you can just, yeah. you know, build off of that, stack it and lead it to that cert certification or that degree, or whatever you choose. And I also like the fact, and this is why I think it's important, the integration of the 21st century yeah. piece, right? And, and truth be told, our liberal arts folks need that because we can't really say to an employer, yeah, this person is a critical thinker. This person's a problem. 
Well, can we prove it? No, we can't prove that. But this allows us to bring that proof. Mm -hmm. uh, Sue, did you want to speak to the, the gateway effect? Yeah, I'd, I'd say all the things that we're doing are great. And we can engage, especially Ivy Tech being a statewide system. I think we have the opportunity to engage partners at a bigger level, not just mm -hmm. individual companies, but whole industries. Uh, you know, whole industry associations across the state. I'll use the example of what we've just done statewide with nursing. Obviously, there's a, a big, this is not a micro pathway, but it is the example of when you have a huge shortage in workforce and with a statewide hospital association, we're expanding by 600 RNs in the next four years, already the largest program in the country. And how do we do that in building those pathways? So medical assisting to RN, to, you know, paramedic to RN, but also doing it exactly with that employer group, not single employers uh, and knowing that they can come to us and we will build the micro pathway they need for their workers. So they're already beginning to talk about what other areas of healthcare can we help build? And that's where, because we've proven ourselves at a big area, traditional area, can we go in at a large scale, at scale? CDL, of course, you know, from what, uh, what Ivy Tech's done with CDL Plus, that's a great example where it's the whole association, it's the whole need of, uh, of a state that has large interest in supply chain. And mm -hmm. how do we build the credentials that the whole industry needs and have their support, which then gives us the kind of, no one's asking us, are you doing the right thing or not? There's no two year or what, what should right. you be up to? We're meeting the needs of employers at scale for a state. So I think those partnerships we've been working on for five years, they're getting more and more robust where there's trust that that pathway we build that stackable credential is aligned to their needs and to your point they've been along working alongside us throughout this whole time and I think that's important to change the whole paradigm of higher education is it it can't be just in our buildings it has to be the outside world affirming validating supporting um, and actually driving us to do this right pushing us to do this so that we don't have to argue with the liberal arts side of the house, right? This is just, we, especially community colleges, this is our mission to scale mm -hmm. up a workforce of the future. That is what we do. And if that's a two-year associate's degree, terrific. That's a transfer to a four-year, terrific. But if it's a micro credential, that's what's needed and that's where we should go. Well, and isn't it interesting that it's, it's almost like the line is blurring between vote tech and, um, you know, sort of college type, uh, traditional college work, because everything's becoming more technical and everyone needs, you know, the, the IT skills. And it, 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 it really kind of levels that playing field at the same time that you're trying to level the non-credit and credit. I mean, it becomes a pretty false distinction. Is that what you're seeing? I see that with your, yeah. so this is a CDL. Well, the IT, think, well, an yeah, IT cloud, ahead. right? What right. parent is gonna argue with their son or daughter who wants to go, get an IT cloud uh, micro-credential, right? Because they know it will stack to something better and better and better that it is the beginning of a great career. So yes, I believe we have, and we should have always, but but mm -hmm. we are where we are. So let's stay on that second curve and continue the ride. And it's up to us to make sure we're not messaging any differently to our students, our employers, to our constituents, that these are all of value and learning is learning and uh, competencies are competencies. And as that adult learner, that we make it possible for them to get something of value from us in the size they can afford both in time and resources and then get a, a more productive, a better job uh, mm -hmm. to see that success. And they can get there just in a different path. Yeah, I mean, I want, on the flexibility point, I mean, what we're learning is that people, it's not so, it, it, they need to either be able to come in and out 
of their training or do it alongside. And so, mm -hmm. then, you know, so you, you all have, or your great, your, your micro pathways are great examples of how people can either do them part-time as a worker on the job, as we heard from Courtney uh, earlier, uh, who was, you know, the residential construction employer, um, or that, um, that you, that you can do it, you know, part-time um, or, or short form, you know, eight weeks right. or something so that the time that you have to take off is then quickly, you know, you're able to get back on a financial track. The, the vast majority of our, that new majority learners we talk about are working adults. Mm -hmm. and, and we can't ask them to take eight weeks out or six weeks out or 12 weeks out or heaven forbid a year out of their, their, their work life. And they are working. So they're getting the, those professional skills in their job already. So how do we make that an easier path for them? And if they're with an employer, we have many in Indiana, we have several hundred, what we call achieve your degree employers who've already committed to upfront tuition assistance of those students, of their well, employees, great. right? So now they're a real easy ask into these uh, micro credentials because they've already said yes to helping that employee skill up. Uh, so I think this is um, something that we can do pretty easily, but it is a change in the way we communicate. So uh, you mentioned affordability, um, and we did get uh, some questions uh, throughout the afternoon about, okay, well, how do how do learners pay for these? What do they cost? What do you, you know, if this is going to be a big piece of 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 your offerings in the future, uh, micro pathways that can stack, and most of them start on the non credit side where you are not compensating. Yeah. The tuition model is not great. Um, what do you do? How are you going to sustain the 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 college? I know, uh, Dr. Glasper, as the emeritus chancellor of Maricopa, you uh, you have some strong views about this, um, and others may too. How 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 do we how do we sustain the new models if they're better for learners, but probably not better for the institutions financially? Uh, I think you start off with one of your slides by saying that you're proving proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you are uh, developing more micro credentials and micro pathways than initially planned. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're, uh, I'll make a prediction. And, and my prediction is that within the next five to seven years, uh, credit and non-credit will have merged. Hmm. Uh, if, if the co uh, Community College Growth Engine Fund is able to uh, expand, replicate and scale with the energy level that we have seen on this screen and for the last year and with the funders and others and businesses coming to the table, then the voice will begin to and continue to rise. I see two colleges here that are, that are in the, uh, the Higher Learning Commission area of service. I will no longer call it a region because it doesn't have a region. <laughs> uh, but what I, what I will say is, is that uh, we, we have operated out of fear. We've operated and, and we've used accreditation as, as, a, uh, as a means to stop. And that's within the institution when faculty did not want to move uh, when they didn't want to consider the conversation that we're having now, but now we're proving that it can benefit our students. And when we talk about the majority learner, you talk about who's most impacted. We talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is where the numbers are. Uh, these are our students. You can, if you can prove and put resources behind it, and the resources are coming from both local and also uh, uh, public industries and the, some individual student resources, then it has no choice other than to continue to scale. And then students will all and continue to come in and out of their, their workplace and, and see that a two-year degree and or a four-year degree is viable because of that return on investment. So I, I'm excited about what's, uh, what's happening here. In, in 19, excuse me, 19, 2019, the Higher Learning Commission and I and I, uh, I helped to chair a paper that talked about the unbundling of higher ed. This was in April of 2019. 
It talked about credentials. And, and, and look at where we are today. People are looking for a, a reason to say that this is valid. And I think that the proof is here. We just need to maintain the energy, continue the funding levels, and ex exceed the funding levels. Uh, and also, what we need to do one other thing. The, the other thing that I would suggest that we do is, is focus on the whole myth that majority learners cannot learn, majority learners do not want to learn, majority learners uh, uh, like being unemployed, which is a bunch of bull, and everything we're doing is, is about myth busters. Uh, and, and it will demonstrate uh, that proof to pudding. The last thing I will say is that the National Science Foundation is promoting a notion of missing millions. Mm -hmm. The missing millions fit the same profile that we are talking about now and is focused on trying to get a million individuals that meet the profile to get into undergraduate STEM. The programs we're talking about are in undergraduate STEM. There's money at the federal level that is unused, untapped, because we don't believe that it undergraduate STEM are the programs that we're offering at our community colleges. Bust that myth, impact the, the missing millions, spend the money, and, uh, and take a little uh, pressure off of our colleges who are, are, are challenged and think about this notion of Will I succeed or not? Take a path to success and keep moving. Well, Kathleen, can, can I? Yeah, go ahead. I was Rufus just going to turn is, to I mean, you, actually. Rufus is hitting on the heart of things that are going to impact our business model. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I, I hope, I, I applaud him for saying five to seven years. I was thinking it'd be by the end of this decade. So we're probably closely close, aligned close. In, in, in that regard. But that notion of proof of concept is, is powerful. And so when I sat down with one of our business leaders to talk about uh, what we're doing in micro pathways, and I talked about in the non-credit side, uh, I said, I need your support. If you provide the funding, this is, and he's given us two years of funding for a specific hmm. area that we're going to get the data we're, we need to go make that proof of concept argument. So I think that's one, and I know data is one of the key elements mm -hmm. of the design. And I think that's going to be critical. So what the work we're all doing is going to be uh, essential to what Rufus was, was making the point about. But I'll say the other thing, it's how we have the conversation with our employers. Sitting down recently with a group of employers, instead of saying credit versus non-credit, you start the conversation about what is it that they need, and they start describing to you what that is. And then you quickly realize that we're talking about skills and competencies, mm -hmm. not credit and non-credit. And then you ask them at some point, uh, and I did this, do you care? They don't <laughs> care. This is what they need, right? So I think training our educators to know how to have that dialogue because we quickly go to this dichotomy, credit, and then it kills the conversation. So let's flip it around. And I think the work we've done with you and your team is going to help a lot in, in doing and moving to what Rufus is talking about. And then that's how we get to the sustainability on our business model. And is there any is there any reason why we can't take these STEM feeder programs because we're working with design, designing those with some community colleges? Why can't those become a piece of micro pathways? Right, they, yes. we don't have to. These are not just uh, they're role specific, um, but when you think about how they stack to other roles, um, the, the you know the traditional you know whether it's engineering or you know uh, hard sciences or nursing, those can be in the later parts of the stacks, right? It's right. not, we're not just trying to track people in and out. I just want to make that really clear. I mean, that's not your intention either, I know. But, you know, I think when people first look at micro pathways, that's the question, you know, is this tracking? Well, and if we're going to be innovating at the speed of business, many times we need to start on the non-credit side, right? I think about the smart manufacturing, the Internet of Things Industry 4.0, those SACA certifications came first. Right. And then we built out the associate degree, right? So this, if we're going to be, whether it's AI, cloud, other, whatever the next new technology is, we really need to start with a micro pathways approach and build up to, rather than waiting 
four or five years so we can figure out what a what a full two or four year degree would look like. Mm -hmm. So I think this just becomes a part of how we co-create what industry needs in real time. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to end on a question around, well, uh, first, first of all, I want to mention the data piece. Um, we are, because this hasn't really come up today, we didn't have any presentations on it because it is you know, it, it's new, but we are creating a data collaborative among the colleges to basically track uh, what happens to learners who go through these micro pathways. Uh, we're also working with um, the Urban Institute on a uh, on, on two evaluations. So we are trying to get really um, clear on the quality, you know, the quality and, con and a continuous feedback loop. Um, because that's really missing in the field as well. We don't know on the non-credit side. We don't know what happens to learners because they're not really getting tracked, right? They're not because they're not getting federal financial aid. Um, so, but but I wanted to end with each of you um, saying something about where you know because we'd like to continue, even though your design year is coming to an end. We'd like to continue the work and we want to scale the model because we have lots of people asking us for it. Um, and the question is, how do you do this at scale, um, you know, beyond the 25 college, 24 colleges that we have now with the two cohorts? W where would you like to take this work at your institutions? We'll start with you, Lee. Well, so fortunately for us, and, and Rufus was a big part of this when he was chancellor at Maricopa, uh, we've been, we, the 10 colleges, we, we have gotten together, our 10 districts, and we're working better together now. And so that we can take an idea from any one district and really start to scale it to the other districts. So I see, we've done this in the advanced manufacturing side. I see us doing the similar thing here. Pima might've been the genesis for our state for this. We can now work with Maricopa because they're now going to be a partner in this. Mm -hmm. And then we all work together and then we get it to all of our 10 districts in the state. If, and of course, Indiana already has the advantage. Sue has the advantage on all of us, but she has the right model, right? For, for us to really think about. And if we start to do it that way, we, we hit all states. So if Sean could take it to, to the, I used to be in, as part of the Washington state system for all of you uh, who may not know my background. So if he can take it to the 34 colleges, then we get Washington state, right? I think that's how we're gonna get there. And the folks at Prince George taking it there in Maryland, and, and all of a sudden, we're going to be scaling a lot faster than, than we realize if we can really get that buy-in. And, and, and that's quick, what my plan is. Get okay, it great. And, and a quick follow-up before we go to uh, Dr. Elsperman on this. Um, we have 144 micro-credentials and 30 pathways now. Do you think these will be or can be adopted in a way that employers, you know, don't have to get confused about this, you know, the, the sea of of new short-term credentials, um, is, that, is that a pipe dream? Or in other words, that everyone's gonna wanna create their own. In other words, will there be some common, we're getting to some common frameworks, um, that's great by industry and, and 21st century skills, I think it, it, that's going pretty well. But uh, do you think that, that we'll be able to use the credentials that are at the end of micro pathways across states? I, I would sure hope we get there. Um, it's something we should aspire to and we should. And, and again, this kind of work puts us in position to do that um, in a non-required way, but one where those early adopters can come on board. So I hope that should certainly be something we aspire to do together because it's good for all. Um, and then I also, I'm gonna, I was nudged by by our team here to say, we've still got to your question about where do we go next, mm -hmm. Kathleen. Um, we have more work to do inside our institution in how we all understand credit and non-credit and that non-credit can happen at the same time as credit and that those are not two different things. And so while I think parts of our organization have really bought in to, micro credentials, micro pathways. We, I don't think we haven't yet communicated that throughout and made it comfortable for everyone to understand how this moves forward and how it builds a more resilient model of community college, one that is truly walking alongside 
industry and students and our communities to be successful. So I think that's going to be a very interesting. And Rufus, I sure hope we can beat your timeline <laughs> on when we get there, because we're going to be pushing it, I promise you. Yeah. Rufus, do you want to take us home on this? Yeah, uh, what, I, what I would like to do is, is to say that the, uh, uh, I'm still in Arizona. I'm still involved with the Higher Learning Commission. And the Higher Learning Commission is looking at this notion right now regarding what's a credential. What does accreditation mean? Offered by a, 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 a regional uh, accreditor or any other organization such as NCCER. And, and how valid is it? And once it's valid, is it portable? So as we start checking some of these boxes, I think earlier about whether or not these micro-credentials and micro-pathways uh, will be portable. Will they be accepted by other colleges? Uh, we need to consider everything that is happening within these six colleges now and the four and the others around the country that, that are coming on board as, as being open source mm -hmm. uh, and encouraging mm -hmm. people and, and sharing the information. Uh, why, why, why should we want to, to hold it close to our chest? Mm -hmm. And if we do that, we can make the journey easier for others across the nation. And I'll close by saying the league is a platform. It is a national platform. Uh, we do webinars. We'll, we, we gladly host an, uh, an education design lab. We'll, we'll host any of the, the colleges that want to come on board and just talk about what their journeys are. Keep the voices out there, make them loud, make them repetitive and engage people and, 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 and show that it is sustainable. Sustainability is the question, but it's also the answer. And this is a strong possibility. And with that, uh, just a great day. Thank you for the <laughs> opportunity to, to voice an opinion mm -hmm. and to be a part of this future success. Thank you. Well, thank you. And we do have one question from the chat. We were uh, going to take questions, um, but I think you know, people have been asking questions all day, but there's one specific for this panel, um, which is, uh, it's sort of directed to Rufus, but I think anyone could answer it. Uh, it's, it's really about Okay, it, it relates back to the very first charge that I mentioned at the beginning of the day, which is can community colleges be the talent broker, regional talent broker between new majority learners and employers? And it really asks the question, you know, why, you know, what's going to be the unique, the unique, uh, uh, you know, the, the value proposition? Why are community colleges going to be able to compete on this? in this role in the future and win out over, you know, I imagine the, the, the question doesn't ask this, but I imagine it's over, you know, external competitors like boot camps or even, you know, even four-year colleges or other other um, other folks that come into the field because there's a lot of money. There's a lot of, you know, for-profit companies getting started in workforce training right now. It's billions of dollars coming into the into the market. I would start with just affordable, it's an affordable model, mm -hmm. affordability. That's Affordability typically grounded in state and local government where there's some funding streams, unlike these ones that will bubble for a while, they'll come and they'll go. We have a commitment from our stakeholders to, to understanding why we're here. And as long as we live true to our mission of being that workforce engine in our communities and our state, I think we have a bright future. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Lambert? And I would say to add on top of all of that, we, we have the airplane, <laughs> we have the car, we have all of the physical things at some point someone's going to need to come and actually be able to do the work on. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't apply what you've learned virtually, then it really isn't, it's not going to have value in the marketplace, right? I think that's our greatest strength is we actually have a physical presence with strong brands almost in many communities across the country. If we take advantage of all this other stuff, move to the second curve, I think it become we become unbeatable. I feel like, I feel like you have learner trust, um, yes. but yes. What, you're, what you need to build in part in this process is employer trust, yes. right? Yes. Um, yes. To, be, to be that partner. Well, this has been exciting. Thank you so much. Um,
for this has been a really fun a fun panel and a great way to you know sort of voice uh, the the ideas that we've been talking about the whole time. Um, so let me thank uh, Dr. Elsperman, Dr. Lambert, and Dr. Glasper for your vision and your support for this process um, from the inception um, uh, in in March of 2020, but also even before that. So thank you. Uh, for, for closing us out today. And, and with that, I'm turning it back over to Dr. Larson.